Thanks. I will begin. You guys seem so uh, seem so far away. It's all very uh, feel very uh, very removed. <laughs> know, it's kind of strange. All right, I'll, I'll pray. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you uh, again for this opportunity, just that we can meet together and to uh, study linear algebra. I just pray you to help us use this time wisely, Lord, for your glory. In your name, I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So. Um, I promised you guys an example. Let me get to it. The, the basic point here, guys, um, and so <clears throat> I won't, and rather than doing general proofs for you guys, let me just give you a couple three by three observations. For example, if I do the determinant of, say, 3000100001, zero, 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 right? then that's nothing more than 3 times the determinant of 1, 0, 0, 1, right? Expanding across the top row. So you get 0 for the other 2 in the expansion across the top row. And so this is really just 3. Right. Um, on the other hand, if I look at the determinant of, say, 1, uh, well, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Again, I'll expand, I'll expand across the top row. So I get, you know, minus 1 times the determinant of these guys, which again is, well, that's minus 1, right? And then, let's see here, what's the other kind of thing we could do? The elementary matrix corresponding to, let's, let's do the elementary matrix corresponding to, say, um, row 2 goes to, Row 2 plus 3 times um, um, row 3. What would that elementary matrix be? So nothing happens to rows 1 and 3. What happens to row 2? What's, what's the elementary matrix corresponding to this row operation? Can you guys tell me? What do I put here? 3. All right. OK, so if you calculate this, we get 1 times the determinant of 1, 3, 0, 1, which is what? Oh, it's 1. Yeah. So in summary, um, if we do a row scaling, that, you know, that costs us something. If we flip a row, if that, that, you know, if the row swap costs us a minus, and um, the type 3 operation doesn't change the determinant at all. And so, of course, you know, row operations are like what? That's the determinant of EA, right? Equals determinant of E times determinant of A, right? By product. So if we do row operations on, on a matrix, we're going to modify the determinant in, according to these three rules. OK? Let, let's try out an example then, because so suppose you want to calculate the determinant of I don't know, let's do something like 3, um, three 1, 2, 1, 2, uh, 0, 1, 7. Oh, 7. No, 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 no 7, no 7. Um, 1, 1. Now, of course, I understand you guys could do this. And I'm not suggesting that row operations is the right way to do it. I want to illustrate this technique for you, is all, OK? There are other more symbolic problems where row operations are like fantastic. Um, but this, this, of course, if I was just tasked to do this and I wasn't you know, forced to do it in a particular way, I would just pick my favorite expansion. I'd probably expand across the middle row or the middle column since there's a zero there. You know? Or I might just do it across the, across the top column because, I mean, top row because I'm, that's my, my habit. Anyway, so if we were to do row operations, right, this would be equal to the determinant <clears throat> of 3, 1, 2, um, 0, minus 3, uh, minus, let's see here. So I'm, what I'm, I'm thinking about going from here to here is row 2 minus 3, row 1, and row 3 minus, oh, I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Here, let me uh, fix that. Let's put, a, let's put a 1 here, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, and let's put the 3 down here. That's more exciting. That's what I wanted. Sorry, guys. So row 
2 minus 3 row 1 and row 3 minus 2 row 1. All right, so in other words, I'm just clearing out below the 1, you know? And let's see here. So that puts a minus 3 there. We get 1 minus 2, which is minus 1, right? What happens to the last column here? Is that minus 5? And this becomes what? Uh, minus 3, right? Then my suggestion would be to, let's see here. Well, this is equal to minus the determinant of 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, minus 3. 0 minus 3 minus 5. Why is it? Why do I? What, why minus? Because I just did what? Switched a row. Yeah, I switched a row, right? So I have to multiply by minus. Um, and then, of course, this is going to be equal to, you know, minus the determinant of um, 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, minus 3, 0. 0. So here I'm going to do row 3 plus, or rather minus, 3 row 2, which is type 3. That doesn't change the determinant, right? So it's still equal to minus what it was before. Um, let's see here. So uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. 0. What's that? 4. Four. All right. And then shame on me for not saying this in lecture already. What's the determinant of a triangular matrix? Right, it's the multiple, you just multiply the diagonals, either upper or lower, or also diagonal. That I should have said, like, Monday. That's an important fact that should be shared. I mean, I, I gave you the much more technical result that the determinant of block diagonal is the product of the determinants of the blocks, and so, in my defense, if you look at the case of one by one blocks, that gives you that the determinant of a diagonal is the product of the diagonals. But anyway, this is a, a very, and, and of course you can get that by just expanding, expand wherever you want, you'll find that. But this is going to be minus one times one times minus one times four, which is of course four. Now, you're like, well, that's a really weird way of calculating. How many, show of hands, who, who thinks that way is calculating is weird? I don't want to pressure you to do it. I mean, are you comfortable with that or do you like the way we've been doing things? You like it? You like it, okay. Math major? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, just checking. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about it. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't need to write this again. So if we just expand across the top, top row, it's, it's 1 times 0 minus 1 minus 1 times 3 minus 2 plus 2 times 3 minus 0, which is uh, minus 1, minus 1, plus 6. So obviously that's faster if you're fluent in that, right? I'm just telling you, there are symbolic problems where doing row operations to calculate the determinant is very, very useful. All right, so now you know. So you guys have any questions about anything in particular? Now that I got that out of my system, I have endless examples to show you for determinants. And we can talk about the upcoming event Monday if you have questions. I can talk about eigenvectors. There's an eigenvector problem. I haven't talked about eigenvectors yet in here. Let me go there. Get the ball rolling. Let me talk about eigenvectors for a second. So the eigenvector problem is a problem we'll spend considerable time on in here. And basically the question is this. I've got a matrix A, right? I've got, and I want to take a vector V times that matrix, right? And what do I want to get back? I want to get back just a multiple of the same vector again. Such a thing is called an eigenvector. So if I can get back that this is, say, x times v. And we usually use lambda for x instead of the x, but 
think I might have put a problem in your homework which uses x rather than lambda so you're more comfortable. But typically we use lambda for the eigenvalue. Well, if v is non-zero, so if, if, you can, if, you, if you can find lambda doesn't have to be zero. Lambda could be anything. Lambda in your field and v not equal to zero, then v is eigenvalue, eigenvector rather, with eigenvalue lambda um, for a, which is taken from the field f square, square matrix. So one of the major tasks in this course is understanding eigenvectors and eigenvalues and what they do for you. At the moment, it's just kind of an interesting discussion related to the problem of invertible versus non-invertible matrices for us. Okay, let me show you why. Um, so if you look at this eigenvector problem, right, you can rewrite this as follows. You can rewrite that as um, AV, right, minus lambda times the identity matrix times V equal to zero, right? Then we could factor V out, V is a vector. So we got this matrix A minus lambda times the identity matrix times the vector V is equal to zero, right? What kind of system of equations is this? If we look at this system right here, what do we have? We have, well, is it consistent? Is this a consistent system? Does it have a solution? Can you guys tell me a solution to this problem? A minus lambda i times what equal to zero? Can you tell me what vector to multiply to get zero? Zero, right. So this is definitely consistent. It is a consistent problem. It has a solution, right? So if zero is the only solution, what can you tell me? Think about this logically. If v equals to zero is the only solution to this, let me call it star, then what can you tell me about the coefficient, the coefficient matrix? It has to be invertible, right? So A minus lambda I must be inverse exists, right? And now that, that's, that's lovely. And we have that list of like seven equivalent conditions I wrote yesterday. Although if you look at my notes, I got more. I go out to M at the end of your chapter, right? Because I, I brought a little bit more nuance in the, in the notes version of the equivalent statements. Because I separate, separate out the left versus right, in, 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 in right, left versus right inverses. And I think I also slew, threw onto the list in the notes that the reduced echelon form of the matrix is I. Those are the other, th I think I missed that in class yesterday, but whatever. But what's a more convenient calculational thing? What can we say? AKA, how about this? The determinant of A minus lambda I is not equal to zero, right? Logically then, if I want this system to have an eigenvector, remember eigenvector, that's not an eigenvector because zero by, de by definition is not an eigenvector. So if I want this system to have eigenvectors, what must be the, must, must be the case for this matrix? If V not equal to zero, um, solving star exists, then we must have what? The determinant of A minus lambda I equal to zero. Now you notice that lambda is a variable here. I didn't tell you what lambda is. I mean, you could say it's X if you'd rather use X instead of lambda. It's a constant, it's a constant in the field of consideration that we don't know yet, right? And if you look at that equation that I just wrote and boxed in, that's called the characteristic equation, the so-called characteristic equation for the matrix. And um, 
if you look at it and study it, what you're going to see is that it's an nth order polynomial matrix in lambda, which means we may or may not be able to solve it depending on the details of the matrix. But if we can solve it, we're going to find that we can find eigenvectors. Really, this is just a straightforward outgrowth of what we've already talked about in terms of invertible versus non-invertible matrices. And the fact that if that equation has more than one solution, it must be that the matrix is not invertible, which is to say the determinant of the coefficient matrix must be zero. So this is the logic underlying one of your homework problems. Let me put a number on it. 49? Oh, yeah, and 49 is a really weird version. I mean, <laughs> so 49, it's one of those things where I, I had so many homework problems, right? And I wanted to have a homework problem about blocks, and I wanted to have a homework problem about eigenvectors, and I thought, I'll just put them together. <laughs> so that's what that happened there. Um, here, I'll show you a simpler version. For example, if we had the matrix A, equal to, let's say, um, oh, goodness gracious, now this is all, um, um, stink. Um, look away. Oh, anyway, let me not try to, it's one of those things that I actually have to, uh, I don't do well when I try to just write them down right off the top of my head. Well, here, I mean, I can write it down. I just won't finish the problem. Suppose we had 5, 6, 8, 8. And you wanted to find what the eigenvalues were for this matrix. What you'd have to do is look at the determinant of a minus lambda i, which would be the determinant of what? 5, 6, 8, 8. What does this lambda i mean? That's lambda times 1, 0, 0, 1, like so. So what we're looking at is the determinant of 5 minus lambda, 6, 8, 8 minus lambda. And since I just made this matrix up, it's not going to be particularly nice, I'm just telling you. That's going to be, so we got 5 minus lambda times 8 minus lambda minus 48. Multiply that out, what you got? You got yourself a lambda squared. And how many? We got minus 8, minus 13 lambda. You. Uh, plus 40, right? Minus 48, so minus 8. So if we're dealing with a real matrix, um, you know, the question is, if you set that equal to 0, is there solutions? How would you see that? Here's what I'd do. I would say that's lambda minus 13 over 2, quantity squared, right? And then I, to be fa fair, I've got to subtract 169 over 4, right? And um, because I just added 169 over 4, and that 8 is actually what? 32 over 4. So you see what we got is we got lambda minus 13 over 2. Um, you know, plus the uh, square root of, what was that, 1, 199, 201, 201, yeah, 201 over 2, lambda minus 13 over 2 minus the square root of 201 over 2. Anyway, eigenvalues, uh, lambda plus or minus, if you like, uh, 13 over 2, plus or minus the square root of 201 over 2. 
And this is why you shouldn't just make, off, make up eigenvalue examples on the fly. These sorts of things will happen. You know. Generally, the solution to a quadratic equation over the reals is not pretty. Anyway, you're not supposed to understand all of the nuances of eigenvectors just yet. I just am trying to illustrate yet another use of the determinant. We have talked about last class how the determinant is super useful for, you know, finding formulas for the invertible matrix and understanding when a matrix is invertible. But it's equally, equally useful, in fact, more useful perhaps, to describe when a matrix is not invertible. And non-invertibility of a matrix is in fact tantamount to the existence of eigenvectors, which is we're going to see a very interesting thing as we go on in here. So, here, let's another example, something a little bit more mundane. What if you had the matrix like, you know, three k, um, two k, zero one zero k three, and we ask the question, you know, basically the question I'm really trying to get at here is for what k is the um, set of vectors 3, k, 0, k, 0, k, um, 2, 1, 3, um, linearly independent? For what k, right? So really, you're asking the question, if I take this times c1, c2, c3, right? You want that equal to zero to imply what for linear independence? Yeah, they, they should all be zero. If they're all zero, then that, that's what we need for, for linear independence because, again, this is just a linear combination of the columns, right? So in terms of determinants, what do we need? What would, what would linear dependence be? Linear dependence would be not a unique solution, right? So let me call this thing S. So S would be linearly dependent if there exists C1, C2, C3, not all zero, right? such that the matrix S times C is equal to zero, right? But the matrix S times zero is equal to zero, right? Which means linear dependence is going to be the case when the matrix is not invertible, which says what about the determinant of the matrix in the, in the, in the linearly dependent case? Yes, if the de exactly, Emma. If the determinant's zero, that will force linear dependence of that set. And that's wonderful because determinant zero is a simple equation amongst the components of the matrix, right? So what's the determinant of S? It's, you know, three times zero minus k minus k times three k minus zero plus 2 times k squared minus 0, expanding across the top row because I'm lazy. If I was smarter, I would have expanded across either the middle column or the, right? Oh, that would have been like a lot smarter, wouldn't it? Anyway, what's done is done. What do we got? <laughs> I see a minus 3k squared. I see a plus 2k squared. So I've got a net of minus k squared, right? Minus k squared, then what? Minus 3k, c factor. Factor out the minus k, what do we got? Minus k times k plus 3, right? So that tells me that either k equals to 0 or k equals to minus 3 make s linearly dependent. So if I ask the question, what values of k make the set linearly independent, what do you tell me? 
Right. So you, any, any real number except for 0 or minus 3, assuming we're working over the reals. If I don't say which field you're working over, you may state at the start of the problem, since you didn't say, I'm going to choose for you, we're working this problem over the rationals or reals or whatever floats your boat. If you want to really be a jerk to the greater, work over Z11 or something, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, teach us a lesson for not specifying the field, you know. No, don't, don't, don't beat me. <laughs> All right, I got that on my system. There's your brief introduction to eigenvectors. We will come back to this. It's just one of the things that's on my heart as I think about back on the course as I've taught it before is this should be said around here because this is where we first talk about the connection between determinant and invertibility of the matrix and really the heart of the eigenvector problem is exactly this determinant non-zero tied to invertibility thing. So. You guys have questions? Yeah. Number 27. <clears throat> Number 47. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see here. Perhaps you'd like for me to show you a specific numerical example of the general thing you're supposed to calculate. Would that be helpful? If I did it with specific numbers for A1, A2, and 3, and B1, B2, B3, then you can do the general thing. Does that seem fair? Okay. Or is there a specific question you have? I don't have a question. Just a general feeling of unease? Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. That's because I'm being formal, right? I mean, in the sense that I haven't really told you how on earth we construct this E1 wedge E2 thing, right? I just said, hey, these are the rules, and do some calculations on it, you know? And um, so... <clears throat> Determinants are really way worse, right? But because it's a number and I gave you a formula, you don't feel so bad about it, right? <laughs> These are actually simpler, but because they're very abstract, you know. Okay, so here's an example. Um, let's suppose we have the, the vector 1, 2, 3, and we want to study the wedge of that with, let's say, 7, 0, 6, right? My claim. My claim is that if we, let me call this thing, call this thing A, let me call this thing B, all right? My claim is that if we look at A wedge B, it's going to be the two vector which corresponds to the cross product of A and B. Now here, A cross B is what? So in um, calculus three, we use this formula. We say it's the determinant of X hat. Well. For us, it's the determinant of E1, E2. I really shouldn't even write this. This is mathematical heresy. Um, I mean, this is, this is a heuristic. It's not a legitimate formula. And the reason you can appreciate why this is not a legitimate formula, because you're linear algebra students, and you realize I've just written down a determinant, which on the top has vectors, and the second row has numbers, and the third row has numbers. But what did I define? I'd only define determinants for what? for all of the entries of the matrix being the same type, right? This is a really weird thing to write down, and yet we all know what it means. It means you follow the pattern to the determinant. So <laughs> essentially this is just a mnemonic to say, hey, expand across the top row in sort of the natural stupid way, which is E1 times 12 minus 0 minus E2 times 6 minus 21 um, plus E3 times... Uh, 0 minus 14, at which point we will get that the cross product of A and B, right, is nothing more than the vector 12, 15, minus 14. Now, I did not write the formula, the heretical formula that I just wrote in your, in your mission, right? I just gave you a formula for the cross product in terms of explicit components of A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. What I wrote is not heretical. 
It's just correct. An equivalent to this de determinant mnemonic that we know and, well, some of us love. Um, now, just as a check, for all you Calculus 3 students, the dot product of this and either one of these should be zero, right? So let's check. We've got dot 12, 12 plus 30 minus 42, 42 minus 42, yay. And here we've got 7 times 12, 84, minus um, 6 times 14, also known as 84. So the dot product, this is in fact perpendicular to both of these. I would have to be very unlucky to get this wrong. So there's the cross product. Now, I also define the flux form, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, two vector corresponding to the vector, let's say, I need, I need more letters. Um, let's say Pac-Man, Ghost, and uh, Dead Ghost. Are they, aren't all ghosts dead? I don't know. But anyway, so um, the way this works is Pac-Man of E2 wedge E3 plus Ghost of E3 wedge E1. All of a sudden, I'm putting indices up. I'm sorry about that. This is a problem I have. I'm, I'm a recovering upper, upper index person. Let's see here. And then plus uh, dead ghost. Seems like a good name for a band. Um, E1 wedge E2. I mean, this is the definition of the um, correspondence between vectors and two vectors. So called, or multi vectors as they're sometimes called. So, okay, so the point is that's the definition. So if we look at the two vector corresponding to A cross B, what do we get? We get 12 times E2 wedge E3, right? Plus 15 times E3 wedge E1, and then minus 14 times E1 wedge E2. Exhibit 1. Exhibit two. <laughs> Exhibit two is we can just calculate the wedge product of A and B. So A wedge B. That's one, two, three wedged with seven, zero, six. And if you stick with this notation, you're going to get lost. So we got we to gotta break back into, that's like E1 plus 2E2 plus 3E3 wedged with seven, um, 71 plus 6E3, right? Now, what did I tell you? I told you guys that the wedge product distributes, right? And we can pull scalars out. So let me, let me, cal let me calculate here. This is 7 E1 wedge E1 um, plus 6 E1 wedge E3 um, plus 14 E2 wedge E1 plus 12 E2 wedge E3 plus 21 E3. 3 wedge E1 um, plus 18 E3 wedge E3. But I also told you that the, um, the wedge product was anti, it's, it's skew symmetric, right? So the wedge product, wedge product of two vectors is minus if we switch the order, just like a cross product. So like A wedge B is minus B wedge A for vectors. So that says what? It says these guys are zero. Right, just like the cross product of a vector with itself is zero, the wedge product of a vector with itself is zero. And then you see, I've got to, I've got to ma make these match with these, right? So I need, I need like a two, three, a three, one, or a one, two. Okay. It's one of the things I miss from grad school is watching undergrads like come into like a six or seven hundred level class. Sit down in the back, and then, I mean, in the class has got like four people in it, right? But then they don't leave. They like just commit to it, right? <laughs> like they're supposed to be there, and they'll stay there for like an hour sometimes. It's hilarious. I, I love it. Usually at the start of the semester, you know, but uh, that's a year. Um, but you know they're not supposed to be there because you know everybody in your program anyway at that point, you know? Minus 6, E3, wedge E1. Um, let's see here. Minus 14. E1 wedge E2. Um, that's already in the right order. Don't need to change it. This one is already in the right order. And I think that's it, right? So then just combine things. What do we got? 
uh, 15, e3. Let me just write them in the right order. Which one comes first? 2, 3, right? So we've got 12, e2, wedge e3. Then it's supposed to do the 3, 1. So that's plus 15, e3, wedge e1. And then what else we got? Oh yeah, I'm, I can't do math. Minus 14 e1 wedge e, I'm, I'm, And so if you compare 1 with my 2, what do we got? As you can see, they're equal, right? And, th and this is, you can easily replicate this calculation with instead of having 1, 2, 3, and 7, 0, 6, having a1, a2, a3, and b1. B2, B3, just follow the same basic series of steps. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we, ha we have to do 1 and 2? Is that like. Oh, that's just. No. Okay. No, that's just how I organize the calculation. I mean, you could equally well have just said, and this by definition is equal to the two vector corresponding to the vector 12, 15, minus 14, and, and you know, like this. <laughs> is also self-contained, right? I mean, this is just an observation. Really, that's the, 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 the full, full story. Let me finish this story. What happens if we take A wedge, B wedge, C? And let's say that um, C is, you know, so we're looking at 12, E2 wedge E3 plus 15, E3 wedge E1 minus 14, E1 wedge E2, and you guys pick your favorite C. What do you want? What do you want to make C? Let's let C be uh, how about uh, 10, 11, 12? Why not? Right? Oh, I know why not. I'll make it super big. How about uh, how about zero, two, one? There, that's nicer. So this would be what? 2e2 plus e3. And what happens when you calculate the wedge product of these three vectors? I already did the wedge product of the first two, right? What happens as we wedge with the third one? Here, let me, any, anytime there's a repeated thing, it's zero is the thing. So like e2 with e2 and e2 with e2, this, this, these are zero. So as you wedge this with that, only this guy and that guy give non-trivial things. They give us, what, 30? E3 wedge, E1 wedge E2. And then how about the E3 term? So only this with this is non-trivial because there's a 3 in here and here which will wedge to 0. And it is repeated 3 E3 wedges to 0. So just the purple with the purple which gives us minus 14 E1 wedge E2 wedge E3. Let's see here. And that's really 30 minus 14 E1 wedge E2 wedge E3, which of course is 16 E1 wedge E2 wedge E3. What happens if you guys calculate the determinant of, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 7, 0, 6, and uh, 0, 2, 1. I'll be lazy. Yeah. Ah, well, here's the, the, uh, the stitching on the fastball here. Um, E1 wedge E2 is minus E1 wedge E3 wedge E2, which is minus E1 wedge E2, well, minus E2 wedge E3, which, of course, is just E1 wedge E2. The, the, um, but that's a good question. So the, the point was, the reason I... I don't generate a sign there is because I had two. I had to flip it tw two times. Okay. Yeah. 
just like with the determinant, if you take two rows and you swap not one row but two rows, you know. Um, so, can, did you guys figure out what this determinant is? I, do I need to? I, I'll find. I'll count. If I must, one times minus twelve minus seven times what two. Minus, uh, minus 6, yeah? What's that equal to? Minus 12 plus 28, also known as 16. What do you know? So this is a different way you can calculate um, determinants. You could take like a vector 1, wedge a vector 2, da da da, wedge, wedge a vector n. That's going to be the determinant of the vectors put into a matrix, and then E1 wedge E2 wedge da, da, da wedge EN. So this is a, you can implicitly calculate determinants by just taking wedge products of vectors is the point. This problem really just shows you how it turns out for three vectors in R3. But this is the tip of a more general idea. But you know, I mean, part of the disadvantage of doing it this way is it doesn't give you a formula for the determinant, right? It just kind of implicitly defines it as, a, as the coefficient which appears here after you take the wedge product of all of these things and rearrange things so that eventually you just have E1 wedge through EN, which requires these kinds of sign flips as you think about all of the different vector basis vectors involved. But, all right, anyway, I'm, I, I think that should be enough for you guys to do the homework. This is not really, uh, you know, something I should dwell on. Too long. Yeah. You guys have any other questions? Yep. Question. Go for it. Here? Here? Yes. Oh, so uh, that uh, yes. Uh, yes, so that it matches with the definition of this thing. Just, it's just for the purpose of comparison. Yeah, just pattern matching. Nothing too exciting. I mean, they commute. They're not different. Um, it's addition. Did you guys want me to do one of the differential ones? Is that still mysterious? Are you guys okay on that one? You want me to do something with differentials? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I spend like a day on it, but it's not required material. Yeah, yeah. If you had Wang's Calc 3, you most certainly did not do it. He's a sensible person. He wouldn't cover it in Calculus 3. Um, as you know, I'm not. All right. Um, so I need a couple of equations. How about this? Uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared equal to 7. And um, just to make my life relatively simple, x, y, z, w equals to 2. So we're looking at, uh, you know, two equations in four unknowns, they're nonlinear, right? This is not the kind of system we learn how to solve in here, right? Is this a linear system? It is not, right? I mean, it involves squares of the variable and the product of variables, neither of which are within our domain. But the neat thing is, that when you take the differential of these equations, it becomes a linear equation in the differentials. So you just take the total differential of both, which I've done for you in your homework problem, right? And so that gives us like 2x dx plus 2y dy plus 2z dz plus 2w dw equal to 0. And um, this is annoying, if you don't mind. I'm going to make that xy plus zw to be less annoying. Okay. 
And so then I've got, um, I got y dx plus x dy plus w dz plus z dw equal to zero. Um, to study z and w as functions of x and y solve for um, dz and dw. All right. So I think in my, if you're tracking the homework problem that I'm trying to give you some kind of, you know, toy, toy example for. <laughs> oh, I had three equations and how many unknowns? Oh, I had three equations and five unknowns because I wanted you to do a three by three Kramer's rule. <laughs> Sorry about that. But the spirit of the problem is the same. We are now basically the, going from here to here is sort of analogous to your step A, okay? So for us, we're going to have, you know, dz, dw here equals to, so I think I had stars in your homework problem. So if you look at, <clears throat> look at this here, right? That puts a 2z and a 2w here, and this one here, a w, right? And, um, and a z there. So I got to move the other guys, this piece, and this piece, and this piece, and this piece, on the other side, right? So that gives me minus 2x dx, minus 2y dy. In the second equation, minus y dx minus x dy. So you'd, you'd be doing something analogous in part A, um, except you have three equations. And, you know, I tried to illustrate the pattern with stars. Those stars are not the same star, right? I'm not saying you have to find an equal quantity to put out in all. Fifteen stars that are in the problem part A <laughs> to count. So how do you solve this? This is a symbolic two by two problem, right? We could multiply by inverse for this one. That would be that would be actually how I would do this. That would be the best way to do this one. But let me illustrate Kramer's rule since that's kind of the point of the problem I'm trying to help you guys with. <clears throat> what it, what would Kramer, Kramer's rule would do what for me? So do you, it would say dz, so uh, let's see here, words. This is my quote unquote a, this is my quote unquote b, right? So Kramer's rule says that uh, dz is equal to, in our language of the proof, the determinant of a1 over the determinant of a, right? And it would say that dw is the determinant of a2 over the determinant of a, if I'm still using the notation I was using yesterday with you guys. Let me be more specific. That's the determinant. What's a1? Minus 2x dx uh, minus 2y dy um, minus y dx minus x dy. That's my first column. My second column is just, of course, 2w and z. Now downstairs, of course, I've got what? The determinant of 2z, 2w, wz. Which works out to, let's see here, z times minus 2x dx minus um, 2y dy. Um, minus zw times minus y dx minus x dy divided by what? <laughs> 2z 
2z squared, right? Minus 2w squared. So I can clean this thing up considerably. Um, for my dx, what do I have? I've got yzw, yzw minus 2xz, all divided by 2 times z squared minus w squared dx. And then for dy, I've got uh, xzw from the second term um, minus 2yz divided by twice the difference of z squared and w squared, again times dy. But if we study advanced calculus, what we learn is that there's an interpretation here. In particular, this, the meaning of this coefficient, this is exactly partial, partial z, um, partial x, holding y fixed, and, and the meaning of this coefficient is partial z, partial y, holding x fixed. So that would be, so I did, I did part B, and I just told you, um, you know, how to interpret, like the part, uh, part C, you're just supposed to uh, basically read from that. I mean, I can, specifically, this is equal to, when I write that, I mean that this is equal to yzw minus 2xz over twice z squared minus w squared. But you can indicate that by writing an underbrace that, you know, points towards the appropriate part of the expression and, and labels it as such. You don't really have to rewrite the coefficient if you don't want to. And I don't want to do the whole other one, but... It, that would be the determinant of what? 2z, right? w, and then minus 2x dx minus 2y dy minus y dx minus x dy. And the thing is, we already worked out the denominator. We know that that's twice z squared minus w squared, right? Same denominator for both Kramers. Now, if you were to keep going, Right? Da, 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 da. Eventually you get stuff times dx plus stuff times dy. And whatever goes in there, the meaning of these, of course, would be partial w, partial x holding y fixed. And whatever appears here would be partial w, partial y holding x fixed. So. Yes? Can you explain how you got the determinant of the numerator? How did I get the numerator? Yes, this A1, right? A1, just like we talked about yesterday, it's going to be B with column 2 of A in the 2 by 2 case. So what I did was I took the B, right, which is this stuff, and I put it in column 1. And I kept column two as appeared originally in the star, star, star equation. So for you guys, you have three equations, three unknowns, all right, in that homework problem. So you're going to have one column that has differentials in it, and the other two are just going to have functions. So when you multiply it out, you're just going to have one differential in the expressions. They'll just have like a dx, a dy, and d, d, you'll never have like a dx, dy, or a d, dy, dz, or anything like that. Just one. Okay, and then when you solve it, I think that dw is supposed to be a 2w. Uh-oh. Yes. Where did I do that? Did I change my 2 to a z? Yeah. This one? Yeah, that's 2. I think he changed it over here. Where did I do that? In the second part of the numerator of your answer. Over here? <laughs> it sounds like something I might have done. Is your, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> oh man. Oh, stank. <sighs> well, the good news is it simplifies. <laughs> the bad news is it simplifies. I think it simplifies. Yeah. So this W is gone. And this W is gone. And these twos are kaput. Sorry about that, guys. The spirit of the calculation was right. But there's actually a 2 everywhere, so it cancels. There was a W, which was, excuse me, there was a, there was a Z, which actually was a, did I just erase the Z? I should have, oh, good grief. What's wrong with me? The Z is what's gone. W remains. The Z was a 2. There. Are we good now? I think we're good now. Because it's yw times 2, and it's xw times 2. There's a 2, a minus 2xz, there's a minus 2yz on the. Um... Wait a minute. Okay. Unnecessary parentheses, get rid of those, there we go. You guys never have trouble with writing unnecessary parentheses, it's quite the opposite problem. But anyway, unnecessary parentheses problem I, 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 I uniquely harbor. So guys, um, some advice for problem 53. If you haven't done it already, problem 53 Right, you're supposed to find a careful description of this set S, which is all real matrices, n by n square matrices, all right, which do what? Which commute with all other matrices. So you have AB is equal to BA for all B. So, you know, before you even start calculating things, can you tell me a specific, you should be able to tell me two matrices which are in here without calculation. Well, you should expect to find in your answer, part of your answer should be what? The zero matrix, very good, and what else? Identity, right, those have got to be in there. Now, when you have something like this, when you have, you have a condition true for all B, what should you do with such data? How should you handle such a problem as this? Do you guys have any suggestions for me? Well, here's my hint for you. Think about the fact that A times E12 has to be equal to E12 times A. Understand carefully what that means. All right? and then appreciate the fact that you could do that for any IJ. Meditate on what that means for A. We can work out 1, 2 together. What does that mean? How do we, how do we, how do, we do this? What's E1, 2? Square, right? Uh, what was this? This was what? E, little E1, little E2, which would, these are n by 1, right? So the transpose must go over here, eh? So that's an n by 1 times a 1 by n. So this is an n by n, yeah? 